I'm Jessica Summers and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Puerto Rico has been declared a federal disaster area after Hurricane Maria battered the U.S. Commonwealth. That makes Puerto Ricans eligible for financial assistance. Officials say it may take months to restore electricity across the island. President Trump is planning a visit to view the damage. A Mexican official says there is no missing child after the collapsed school that became a focus of rescue efforts after this week's deadly earthquake. They also believe an adult may be alive in the rubble. More than 50 people have been rescued. The death toll is at least 245. And the White House released details of President Trump's additional sanctions on North Korea. A statement today says financial firms must choose between North Korea and the U.S. Trump's executive order, which directly targets North Korea, Korea's shipping and trade networks and issues a 180-day ban on vessels and aircraft that have visited North Korea. And Russia is warning the U.S. it will retaliate against American-backed fighters in Syria. It accuses the fighters of fire and government troops as Russian forces battle alongside Assad's army. A formal warning has been delivered to the U.S. regional headquarters in Qatar. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Jessica Summers. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technologies next. I'm Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Zuckerberg's politicking, why the Facebook chief is handing over information to Congress on political ads bought by Russians ahead of the U.S. presidential election. Plus, Google bets bigger on hardware with a deal to buy top engineering talent from former smartphone giant HTC. We break down the reasoning and the timing behind the billion dollar venture. And Nest refreshes its product line with a focus on the home security market. Our exclusive conversation with CEO Marwan Farwaz about the startup's mission to make homes smarter and safer. But first, to our lead. Facebook says it will cooperate with Congress and hand over information on the political ads that were paid for by Russians ahead of the U.S. presidential election last year. Mark Zuckerberg took to Facebook Live Thursday to address the company's next steps to protect the integrity of the democratic process. We're going to bring Facebook to an even higher standard of transparency. Not only will you have to disclose which page paid for an ad, but we will also make it so you can visit an advertiser's page and see the ads that they're currently running to any audience on Facebook. This week, several Democrats called for Facebook and other social networks to face new advertising disclosure requirements. Facebook is expected to be called before the Senate Intelligence Committee for a public hearing in October with panel leaders demanding a full accounting. Joining us now here in the studio are editor-at-large Corey Johnson and our Bloomberg Tech reporter Sarah Fryer who covers Facebook. So Sarah, what's happening? Zuckerberg is trying to take take this and move it in a direction that is positive for Facebook, right? They have been under so much pressure. Congressional leaders have come out and said, we demand more transparency, we demand more cooperation. Now Facebook is saying, yes, we'll cooperate with you, but we'll also do more for transparency in political advertising on our site and work with governments around the world. He mentioned Germany. Um, to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. And they're trying to build that trust with the government so that they're not under so much fire anymore. It's fascinating that political ads online aren't subject to the same kinds of disclosures that ads on television are. I mean, Corey, what do you make of Facebook's attempting to, to take a proactive so approach So there, there are two reasons that ads and television are, are monitored by the government. And one is the concern about political spending in the U.S. And there's been a great back and forth about that, not least of which was the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court. But uh, this notion that it is good for our democracy to know who's spending money to try to push their issues or their candidates. Uh, the notion of, of Nazis and racists uh, and so on, uh, anti-Semites, pushes that to a whole other level in terms of political discourse. But the other history relates to the difference in the technology, which is to say that when, when, radio, when radio and television were first invented, there were not different parts of the dial allotted to them. It was the biggest signal always won. The federal government came in, the FCC came, they established the FCC, and they said, here's a slice, 
here's a slice, here's a slice. We're going to let you use these slices if you abide by these rules. So it, it created some order in this chaotic world of broadcast. With those rules came the requirement to disclose certain things, and that has been the basis for FCC law ever since. The, the Internet's a wild west. There's an unlimited amount of channels, and as a result, it has not been legislated. But, uh, but we see the effects of this. What we don't know is the role of Russian, uh, Russian uh, money and Russian hacking on the U.S. election. Right. And what we also saw was that Facebook was willing to give over a lot of information uh, with a search warrant to Robert Mueller, we, but giving a lot less to Congress. Con Facebook is sort of suggesting that they're sharing the same amount now, but we don't know if it's the same amount or not. Right, and Facebook suggesting that Congress decide how much the public should know. Right. right. So, so Facebook who wants knows to be... what and what do they know? Right. <laughs> Facebook wants to be the one saying, listen, we went through and did a very stringent review of our privacy policies, our legal rights here, and we're going to give uh, this information to Congress in a way that we feel will will honor that. So Facebook doesn't want to come out and give this to the public because they don't want to set any precedent for having to make people's private stuff public in the future. Um, of course, there are always investigations where people are asking for cooperation from Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram, and the company pushes back on those pretty hard. Now, what's interesting here is uh, the company is trying to figure out how to present itself as like even more transparent than TV in the future, which I was talking with um, our colleague Shira, and she pointed out to me that, well, even if you can do what Zuckerberg says and say, okay, all of these ads are paid for by Corey Johnson, how or do we by know, Russia. or by Russia, how do we That's know it's not a bot? How do we know who this is? Right. Um, they, it it's might it's not possible actually, they don't know. It's possible they don't know right. how much Russia or others just, were involved. It's just an automated system, right? These Facebook ads are not being sold through salespeople. They're, they're being sold through the self-serve advertising system on the platform. Right. And to be clear, they found connection between these ads and Russia, but they don't know who in Russia, whether it's tied mm -hmm. to the government. Whether and they said more shoes could drop. They said they're continuing to look into this and other, uh, they're looking into other state actors and other potential Russian groups. So this story may not be over yet. Now, and the, and the, I'm sorry to interrupt. They, they, uh, they're caught in this bind where they want to say, we didn't have that much of an effect, it was only $100,000, but now they want to seem as if it's full disclosure. We're giving you 3,000 ads as if the number wasn't 2,999 or, or 30,000. It's possible they don't know. It's possible they do know there's a lot more and aren't giving it all up. They put a big number out there. They put a small number out there. They're trying to play both sides of this. Meantime, Sarah, you're out with a new story on the cover of Business Week about Mark Zuckerberg's political aspirations, of which he tells you there are none. He is not running <laughs> right. for office, even though it looks like he does, like he is. What, right. what is your takeaway? My takeaway is that whether or not he's running for president, because only he knows. Right. Okay. Um, there, there are a host of political issues and uh, societal issues and, and issues with Facebook's power around the world that he has to deal with. And he's doing this, you know, also to educate himself, but mostly to present this, this vision of the future of Facebook as this not threatening, very helpful for the future of society. Right. Like he wants to paint the picture of this company as something that is going to be a force for good. And it, it's kind of good timing because as he's doing this, all of these things are coming out, the Russian ads. We talked uh, earlier this week about the targeting against um, race, uh, on racists on mm -hmm. Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. This is all coming out as Zuckerberg is doing this charm offensive around the country, and it's all very curated. So I think it's, in a, very, it's in a very complicated space for Zuckerberg right now, and, and he certainly doesn't want us to think that it's at all strategic, at all curated, um, beyond what he envisions for the future of Facebook. All right, Sarah Fryer, who covers Facebook for us. Thanks so much. Corey Johnson, as always, our editor at large. Thank you as well. Be sure to read this week's cover story on Mark Zuckerberg in the new issue of Bloomberg Business Week by Sarah Fryer and Max Chafkin. All right, well, Amazon is set to open a large new office in New York City and create 2,000 high paying jobs. The e commerce giant has already got several locations across the city, but will expand its presence. The new office will employ people across finance, sales, marketing, and information technology, earning an average of $100,000 annually. Amazon will invest $55 million in the building project in Lower Manhattan's financial district. New York is also bidding to be the location for Amazon's second headquarters.
Coming up, Google is making a big push to beef up their Pixel line of phones and products. How is it doing? With a big time buy of HTC talent. This is Bloomberg. Google is making a push to get more control of phone hardware and software by agreeing to buy a part of HTC's engineering and design teams. The $1.1 billion deal means that Google will have more control over the design and production of the Pixel, as well as other devices. Joining me now to discuss this and more, Super Angel investor Aiden Senkit. He was one of Google's earliest employees and a product manager. He is now founder and managing director of Felicis Ventures, where he's funded companies like Rovio, Shopify, Fitbit, and more. Also with me from New York, Bloomberg's Mark Bergen, who covers all things Google. So Mark, explain how this Google HTC deal is actually going to work. Right. Uh, in some ways, it's sort of a third time's a charm, right? Because Google uh, has obviously done hardware before. They bought Motorola. Uh, they made a big purchase for Nest. Uh, this one's a little bit smaller. It's more of like a talent acquisition. So they effectively have 2,000 engineers that were working on the Google Pixel device from HTC that are now going to be working on primarily uh, and on Google hardware, um, not just the Pixel device, but also you know their speakers, uh, their VR devices, and kind of whatever in the portfolio that they're planning to put out. So, I didn't, some people are worried that this is deja vu. You know, Google spent $12.5 billion on Motorola Mobility, then sold it three years later for $3 billion to Lenovo. What's your take? I think uh, I agree with some of the points that Mark has made. I do think that it is a big competitive battle right now around consumer devices, especially the phones. Um, 2,000 experienced engineers uh, is not going to be that easy for them to get. Uh, I think it's a great move. I also think that it's interesting that it shows that they have learned from the Motorola experience that they're actually getting the 2,000 engineers. But this is not an all-out all acquisition of HTC itself and the manufacturing facilities. And it's a much smaller amount of the billion. Google is much larger now. So from a risk perspective, you know, I'm not sure it's quite in the same profile as the Motorola move was for them. And given how important VR has become and how important, you know, this kind of next generation mobile phones and how VR AR is going to get integrated, I can see why this is pretty strategic for them, not to mention other consumer devices, given the new importance of Google Home. It's interesting. We're going to be talking to the CEO of Nest a little bit later in the show. Mark, you know, what does this deal signal about Google's commitment to hardware and phones in general? And, you know, the relationship between this you know, uh, hardware division and, and Nest and other parts of the company. Yeah, I'll play devil's advocate. I mean, Google signaled a lot of commitments to things and then they've changed their mind, right? Uh, they signaled a big commitment with hardware with Motorola. They signaled a big commitment to Google Fiber and broadband. They pull back on both of those. Um, I do think there's a little bit of th this is Google looking out maybe two to five years in the future and being terribly paranoid, seeing a world in which some of the bigger Chinese Android handset makers like Huawei, um, Xiaomi, Oppo, the really successful ones, don't need Google as much anymore. And, and Samsung is moving with its digital assistant and its own software services sort of away from Google. And that sort of terrifies them and, and when they're competing with Apple. Aiden, is it a defensive move? Uh, I'm not really sure I would see it as a defensive move because Google has really great economics. Um, I think it's just a strategic move of, look, these kind of uh, resources, like there are only few companies in the world that have this kind of, uh, th this scale of engineers, and Google has always been a software company, so I think for them to have more of a knowledge inside the company with respect to hardware, I think it's a good move in the sense that I can see Ruth Porras' influence of, hey, we want the engineers, but we don't want necessarily the cost, the hardware, and the facilities, and all the things that... Uh, to deal with it. Um, I think it's going to be an important area and it could be applicable to several different things like we said like it could be phones but also AR, VR and Google Home. So uh, I, I mean I see it as a strategic move but in terms of you know what's coming up from China again I think software has been like the driver and Google has the monetization engine so I do think those are key assets so that's why I feel like Google still has some great strengths to rely on. So you were one of the first super angels uh, coming out of Google and I'm curious the industry has changed a lot. There are a lot more people angel investing, super angel investing, mm -hmm. seed stage investing. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the competitive landscape today? I mean, it is so different because when I left Google, uh, angel list didn't exist. Y Combinator was just starting out. A lot of these uh, organizations that we know today uh, in terms of you know fostering the growth of startups and the funding, uh, there were maybe a handful of really well-known angels and maybe 40, 50 uh, angel investors that were even making it to the press or people knew. Today, I mean, fast forward, not only are there, I think, 
think, thousands of angel investors, but also there are hundreds of seed funds. Uh, I think on the one hand, it's really great because it, I think, bodes really well for entrepreneurship, but it also means that the number of startups have increased by a factor of 10, 100. It has become much harder for the startups, especially in the Bay Area, to hire people because they have to compete with so many other companies, not to mention Facebook and Google. But on the other hand, I think it's very interesting times because when I think we had a conversation years back, it was mostly around consumer internet, technology kind of booming. Now we have areas that, you know, where we are making, uh, and we are a small fund, but we're making investments anywhere from, you know, satellites to liquid biopsy to, you know, curing, uh, you know, curing, curing cancer and like enter enterprise customers, not to mention some fintech uh, deals. So right. what's really exciting is that so much more is happening in so many more verticals and markets. Um, so it's very exciting times to be in here. Quick question, we only have about 30 seconds, but you just made your biggest investment to date in a company called Guideline, which yes. helps uh, small businesses offer retirement plans, 401k plans. Why are you so bullish on this market? I think this is a trillion dollar market. It's a very unsexy, uh, uh, you know, from the outside market that is not right for disruption, and yet this company is the first full stack company that is trying to take advantage of the fact that this is a key benefit. Retirement is really important, and yet only one out of three uh, employees are using it. And so uh, we found uh, that it's a great opportunity uh, to get involved in a company that can make a fundamental difference here in a market where we haven't seen as much innovation. So we're very excited to be involved. All right, I didn't think it. Uh, Felicis, thanks to have you back. It's been too long. I'll have to back you, have you back sooner than the next five thanks years. Andy. Mark Bergen uh, of Bloomberg Technology in New York, thank you as well. Coming up, the EU wants to make sure its citizens' private data is protected when it is stored on U.S. soil. The fate of the privacy shield. Next, this is Bloomberg. Now to the EU-US Privacy Shield, which is up for its annual review, its first annual review. The Privacy Shield is a joint framework between the EU and the US to protect the personal data of EU citizens that's stored on US servers. There was uncertainty over the Shield's continued existence when President Trump signed an executive order that would exclude non-US citizens from having their sensitive data protected. So. What's going to happen? I spoke with the EU Commissioner for Justice, Vera Jourova, who spent the week in the U.S. to speak with Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross and tech companies about the status of the shield. I met Mr. Ross for the second time uh, and now I came with a little bit of concern that uh, uh, we need to clarify and make sure that we understand the protection of privacy in the same way. And I came with my team uh, to sit with the team of Mr. Secretary Ross uh, to do the review. We had a lot, a lot of detailed legal technical questions and I must say that uh, the, all the work uh, was ongoing in very good working atmosphere and Mr. Ross personally assured me that he has very strong commitment for promoting the shield and keeping it running. What are the main points of contention or differences of opinion? Mm. We have to make sure that uh, the American uh, state authorities have uh, privacy shield under full control that uh, they uh, uh, monitor whether the companies which transfer the data from the EU to the United States uh, are fully compliant with the conditions mm -hmm. and also that there is no mass surveillance uh, collection of data from the site of national security authorities. Uh, this needs to be checked. Privacy Shield is a trust and check exercise. Uh, we trust, but we need to check. What happens to the Privacy Shield if the Trump administration changes its stance? It would be a very bad news and bad message for businesses on both sides of the Atlantic, because this is important not only for the American companies, but also for a number of European companies. And uh, it would be a bad uh, message for Europeans because they rely on Privacy Shield to protect their privacy and their private data. If there is a radical change of the stance, I never hide that uh, I am ready to uh, propose the suspension of the system, mm. but we are not there. I am cautiously optimistic that uh, we will keep Privacy Shield running. Now, you've also been meeting with tech companies here in Silicon Valley this week. You met with Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook. What are their main concerns? 
We had uh, in principle three topics, uh, privacy shield, because most of the companies I spoke to are under the scheme, scheme and they appreciate it as a good legal way of transferring data. The second topic was uh, the upcoming general data protection uh, reform in European Union. This is a big change where we emphasize very strongly the need to protect privacy of people in digital sphere. And the third topic was uh, how to tackle the problem of illegal content mm -hmm. on digital platforms because this is of a high importance for us as Europeans. We want to have rule of law fully in place. Now you're also coming out with a paper that covers how tech companies deal with illegal content mm. online, how it's dealt with in the United States versus Europe. What's your main takeaway? Mm. I spoke to Google and Facebook out of the four uh, companies which are under our so-called code of conduct. Uh, we have their Facebook, Google, Twitter and Microsoft. Uh, those companies committed themselves last year to delete within 24 hours hate speech which has been notified to them. And we agreed on the need to continue this. And I also committed myself to invite more companies to do the same thing. Because uh, we want in European Union to uh, have internet which will be hate free and uh, which uh, will not open the space, I would even say a highway, for hatred and, and for uh, inciting violence. Are they acting on that commitment? Have you seen them move more quickly in terms of getting the content down? They say yes, we recognize we are part of the problem, we must be part of the solution. Mm. And I'm very strong promoter of enhancing their social responsibility. And do you think the US needs to handle this more strictly? like you do in Europe? Ah, it's a big issue here mm. and we discussed a lot the First Amendment of the Constitution which uh, uh, ensures unlimited freedom of expression. It will be up to, to America, to American politicians and people whether they will recognize that simply some speech is so dangerous uh, that uh, the society should uh, prevent it. That was EU Commissioner for Justice Vera Jarova. Coming up, after going for almost a year without introducing a new device, Nest is rolling out a slew of new products. We'll take a look at the items, plus speak with the company's CEO about what is ahead. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. President Trump today issued a new executive order expanding the Treasury Department's ability to cut off from U.S. markets any bank that does business with North, North Korea. Ambassador Nikki Haley spoke to reporters at the United Nations. It only impacts those that continue to do business with North Korea. So if China does business with North Korea, yes, it will impact them. If there are countries in Africa that do business with North Korea, it's going to impact them. So really it depends on countries that choose to continue to support North Korea. A Mexican official says there is no missing child at that collapsed school that became the focus of a rescue effort after this week's deadly earthquake. They also believe an adult may be alive in the rubble. More than 50 people have been rescued. The death toll is at least 245. Puerto Rico has been declared a federal disaster area after Hurricane Maria battered the U.S. Commonwealth. President Trump plans to visit Puerto Rico to assess the damage. He spoke about the devastation during a meeting with Ukraine's president. Puerto Rico is, uh, is in very, very, very tough shape. Uh, their electrical grid is destroyed. It wasn't in good, good shape to start off with, but their electrical grid is totally destroyed. Uh, and so many other things. So we're starting the process now and we'll work with uh, the governor and the people of Puerto Rico. 
Officials say a 10th patient from a Florida nursing home that lost its air conditioning during Hurricane Irma has died. Police confirm the 94-year-old woman died yesterday. Florida has suspended the facility's license, but the owners have sued to block the hold. A criminal investigation is underway. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. This is Bloomberg. at 7.30 Friday morning in Sydney. My colleague Paul Allen is there with a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Well, we currently got ASX futures pointing a third of 1% higher, but let's see what happens when we actually get underway. Iron ore was off 5% overnight, now trading at $66 per tonne. And the Aussie dollar took a real beating, falling about one cent in 24 hours to be the day's worst performing currency. Uh, S&P also cut China's credit rating for one step from A plus to double A minus. That was the first cut since 1989, uh, seeing credit growth posing risks to financial stability there. The outlook also revised from stable to negative. Got some slight weakness on Nikkei futures and the Bank of Indonesia being focused today. We're expecting a cut there to the reference rate of 25 basis points. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology, I'm Emily Chang. Alphabet's Nest is known for its thermostats, smoke alarms and cameras that can be set up in the home and watched from anywhere. Now it's rolling out new devices from doorbell cameras and a home security system with a slew of bells and whistles. Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman got his hands on some of the new devices. Check them out. This is product launch number three for 2017 for Alphabet's Nest. After introducing a cheaper thermostat as well as a 4K indoor security camera, now Nest is taking on the whole home security ecosystem in a big way with four new products. The first is a doorbell called Nest Hello. The device uses your existing doorbell system, but it adds a camera so you can record who's at your front door. It's also come out with a digital door lock in collaboration with Yale. It may not have much unique functionality, but it looks like a Nest product with its sleek design and connectivity with other Nest devices. Number three, a new outdoor security camera that can withstand weather and stream video to your phone. But the most significant new device launched is the Nest Secure. It comes with three main pieces, a main hub with a speaker and a pin pad, window and door sensors, and key fobs. What sets it apart is that it's a complete do-it-yourself kit. You can install the $500 device without needing expert help. And if you want to fork out more, you can have it monitored for a monthly fee. On the software side, Nest is turning some of its cameras into mini Google Homes by adding Google Assistant support via a software app. Now, none of Nest's new products necessarily move the bar forward for the industry. These are all concepts that have not only been tried before, but executed successfully. But still, it's critical for the Alphabet unit to continue releasing products so that its customers will remain in their ecosystem and so that Nest can keep selling them subscriptions on a monthly basis. Mark Gurman, Bloomberg News, San Francisco. That was Bloomberg Technologies' Mark Gurman. Now, on the news of the product releases, I caught up with Nest CEO Marwan Fawaz for an exclusive interview and talked about how he plans to grow the company. Take a listen. It's not just about the product, it's about the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So the ecosystem around, the software behind it, um, the integrations with other devices in the home, for example, our cameras. Uh, so we, every product we build, um, work very closely with any other products we build in the past. So we wanted to make sure that they talk to each other. We wanted to make sure that they're seamlessly, um, the seamless experience, uh, as well as the installation um, and the maintenance of the products are the right experience for our customers. So that takes a while. You took over for, for Tony Fidel, and I'm curious, how are you similar and how are you different to Tony? So we have different backgrounds. I mean, my background is mostly as a service provider background. So I focus a lot on customer uh, support, uh, service, uh, um, areas that uh, around you know, being stand behind our products. 
Um, so that's a, I bring a lot of that background into Nest. So I, you would say that's one big difference. Um, the company still have the same DNA when Matt and Tony started it. Let's talk about that because you know there were reports of cultural issues, infighting. There were there were recalls, and I'm curious how you've moved beyond that and what the stamp is that you want to put on the company. Well, we we want to be a global company. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to continue growing our portfolio of products. We're so excited. I mean, yeah. Yesterday, we've doubled our portfolio of products. That's a big milestone for us. So that's one step of many, many steps we're taking. How about, you know, the culture within the company itself? I mean, do you feel like things have changed, things have grown? Um, just give, I mean, given, you know, some of the reports about some of the difficulties in making this big transition. That you I, I'll tell about. you what I, what, I, what I tell everybody that asks me this, including my friends. Okay. This is the most talented team I've worked with in my career. Um, great talent, great team. I inherited a very strong team and lucky to have that. Um, just building on that. Um, each, each leader has a different style. My style is different, but, uh, but the core business and the core message for our company has not changed. What's your mandate from Larry Page? Um, be a, grow the business and be a meaningful business. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between Nest and Google? We collaborate very closely. Uh, we collaborate very closely on our products. Um, we, uh, we work closely on integrating the different experiences. Yesterday we announced that uh, Google Assistant now is part of uh, one of our cameras. So that's, uh, you know, that's a milestone for, for one of the collaborations. But we work across uh, different areas within Google. Um, you know, we, we leverage a lot of the you know, great technology, especially around machine learning and AI, and we pack our products with a lot of these you know, intelligence, uh, but that's, you know, that's the beauty of being part of uh, Alphabet, is we, we, we have the independence to grow our business while we leverage different technologies across Alphabet. So Google just took a big stake in HTC. Curious what that means for Nest and, and you know, what you know about the strategy there. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's um, it, it's a great uh, opportunity for uh, for the hardware team. Uh, I mean, Rick knows that business extremely well from his back from his background on Motorola. Um, you know, the Pixel product is doing is doing very well. I think it's just a natural extension for that business for them. You mentioned Google Home. This is obviously huge competitive territory. Uh, you know, Google, Amazon has uh, the Echo. Apple has HomePod. When it comes to the connected home. How do you see the competition shaping up? It's an early stage mm. for all of us, all of these companies you mentioned. Um, you know, there are a lot of opportunities still left to, to change the experiences in the home for consumers. I think at the end of the day, consumers will decide what is best for them. How's the rest of the business doing? I know you recently unveiled a new version of the thermostat. Talk to us about sales in general. Uh, we're doing very well. Uh, we continue to grow. Uh, you know, we've talked about uh, you know, our, our products are growing at a, you know, at, at a pace that uh, it's accelerating. Um, you know, we've, uh, this year we'll ship more product than we shipped in the last two year combined. So that gives you, that gives you an opportunity that the growth is there. Um, the expansions, our footprint is, uh, is very important to us. And the doubling of our portfolio is a big deal as well. Um, there's been some speculation that Alphabet might consider selling off Nest to, to a third party. Is there any truth to that? No. Day one when I started, I made sure all of our employees knew that Nest is not for sale. That was Nest CEO Marwan Fawaz there. Well, luxury automaker Mercedes has competitor Tesla in its sights. Daimler plans to spend a billion dollars to start production of Mercedes-Benz electric vehicles at its Alabama factory. This marks the first time a European automaker will manufacture a plug-in vehicle in the U.S. It is part of a bigger bet in the EV market. U.S. sales are projected to grow fourfold by 2021, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Coming up, it is the third recent lawsuit to hit SoFi. The fintech startup with $4.3 billion will speak to both the plaintiff and the lawyer in this high-profile case next. And a feature I'd like to bring to your attention, our interactive TV function. Find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message, play along with the charts that we bring you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg.
is facing some challenges with its hardware business. The company's lab for making hardware, including its Snap Spectacles, video camera glasses, cut about a dozen jobs on Thursday, according to people familiar with the matter. This comes after changing leadership earlier this month. Steve Horowitz, who was in charge of the lab, was moved to a role in a different part of the company. Well, SoFi is the latest high-profile Silicon Valley company to face accusations of an unrestrained workplace culture. The fintech startup was last valued at $4.3 billion in its last financing round in February. Earlier this month, CEO Mike Cagney stepped down amid sexual harassment accusations. And Thursday, a former loan reviewer at SoFi filed a new lawsuit claiming she was repeatedly sexually harassed while working there. This is one of at least three lawsuits filed in recent months against SoFi. Bloomberg News reached out to SoFi for comment, and a spokesperson said, We take any allegations of sexual harassment seriously. While we can't comment on the specific allegations in this lawsuit, harassment of any kind has no place at SoFi. The board and management of SoFi are committed to creating a culture where employees can thrive. Earlier, our Bloomberg News reporter Selena Wang spoke to the former SoFi employee Yulia Zamora along with employment lawyer Robert Ottinger. She started by asking Zamora why she decided to come out with this story now. The main reason really is that people are listening now. If I had come through with any information earlier, no way, no one would ever listen to me. And Robert, you represented Brandon Charles. He was the uh, original person to file a lawsuit against the company, claiming that he was fired for reporting sexual harassment. So how many women at SoFi have come to you since? What are they telling you? We have several people talking to SoFi employees who are calling us. I'd estimate between maybe 30 and 50 people have contacted us. And a lot of people are just airing um, their experiences at SoFi. A lot of them feel like they were abused and treated unfairly. And they just want to tell us what happened. And I'm sure in the recent months, given the events, that Yulia's case is not the first to have come across the desk. So why did you choose to represent her in particular? This case is really unusual because it had, we had sexual harassment that was, in our view, baked into the culture of a company from the very top down. You don't see that um, so often because people were coming to us right away and they weren't talking about low-level managers sexually harassing. They were talking about people at the very top of the company. And in our view, it seemed to be trickling down through the company because there's an old saying, like, you know, um, it's like a fish stinks from the head. <laughs> it's an old saying, but um, I think that happens in companies. If the leaders of a company don't respect women, then the people under them also probably won't respect women like they should. If we examine some of these high-profile cases from Uber, Zenefits, and SoFi, how much of tech's culture problem do you think is due to this alleged grow-at-all-costs culture in Silicon Valley? I think that's a big reason why Yulia had the experience she had. He had a company that was growing so fast, and she was in a location out there in uh, Sonoma County, and they just wanted to grow, 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 make it more efficient, and they weren't paying attention to the rights of people like Yulia. Um, how people feel there isn't the most important thing. It's all about growth and efficiency. And is this something that you would say is prevalent across Silicon Valley? I named some few singular high-profile cases. Yes. Well, it happened in, we think it happened in Uber. There's been a lot written on that. It certainly happened in SoFi, in our, our opinion. And if you just look at the, you know, they have these venture capital firms that are making these big investments in these, in these companies, and they want to get a return on their investment. And you do that by growing and becoming more efficient. And sadly, one of the consequences is that people's rights get walked upon. Oh, yeah. Yulia was walked upon, and she suffered in silence, silence, and now here's one person who's bravely coming forward and sharing her experience. And I, I suspect there's thousands of other women out there in tech companies today who are experiencing what Yulia experienced. And it's our hope that Yulia's courage out here is going to inspire others to come forward, and hopefully these tech companies will be better places to work because of people like Yulia. And in particular, you have an interesting background. You spent time in New York as an employment lawyer, as well as in San Francisco, particularly yeah. also representing people who had worked on Wall Street uh, more than right. a decade ago. Yes. Are you seeing comparisons between what had happened on Wall Street culture-wise and what's now happening in Silicon Valley at financial technology companies in particular? Absolutely. There's parallels for sure, because you see both Wall Street and some of these tech firms, especially fintech, are male-dominated. And you have that same go get attitude, really a macho culture there. It might be fun and great and rewarding for the men, but sadly a lot of women get left behind and stepped on. And you were at the company for about a year. Mm -hmm. At what point did you decide to resign, and what have you been doing since? 
I know that from the beginning I wanted to resign. Um, I even tried going back to my former employer and that just wasn't something that happened. Um, my breaking point really was when all the stress was getting to be too much. Um, my hair was falling out. Um, hives, stomach aches constantly. So for me, it just it wasn't worth it at that point. And I started looking elsewhere. And thankfully, I moved on to better things. All right, former SoFi employee Yulia Zamora there and employment lawyer Robert Ottinger speaking with Bloomberg Selena Wang. Coming up, mothers around the country love the startup behind the smart breast pump, but VCs just won't get behind it. Why Naya Health is turning to Kickstarter next. And a quick programming note, U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross will be joining Bloomberg Daybreak Americas this Friday to talk about trade with China and the president's speech from the U.N. This is Bloomberg. General Electric's new management team is taking aim at its corporate jet fleet. GE is cutting back the number of flights and will replace them with chartered jets. The company intends to sell its planes. New CEO John Flannery is cutting back on the GE Air Force as part of a $2 billion savings plan. Well, the U.S. venture capital industry is 93% male and facing heightened scrutiny for the sometimes fraught relations with Silicon Valley's few female entrepreneurs. Raising money can be even harder for women when their product isn't one men use. Naya Health, the maker of a smart breast pump that is beloved by moms, raised $6.5 million from seed investors, then hit a wall. Now CEO Janica Alvarez and her co-founder, who also happens to be her husband, are turning to Kickstarter in the hopes of keeping their company running. Janica Alvarez joins me now here in the studio. Janica, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So tell me about the pump, first of all. What makes you think it stands out from all the other pumps on the market? We have the first water-based breast pump. So we use a movement of water and a soft silicone cup that feels more like you're nursing your baby than a machine. So what happens is you end up getting more efficiency uh, and more comfort. So you have more milk and less time. So you say that you, know, you can make 30% more milk, 20% faster. You guys also have an app that inputs all of the data uh, and you're building a smart bottle uh, to go with this. And yet, venture capitalists haven't you know, gotten behind this. Talk to me about some of your experiences. I think largely they have a hard time understanding the product. It's something that they'll never use. So I've often been in meetings where investors will have to, you know, say, let me go talk to my wife, let me go talk to my sister. I just don't feel equipped to evaluate this opportunity. So those are a lot of the responses that we get around the product itself. And meanwhile, I'm thinking this is a massive market. It's growing every year, and we have an amazing first product that is defensible. You've also had investors ask you repeatedly about your children. Uh, your husband doesn't get asked these these kinds of questions. Right. You've had investors land on porn sites in the middle of your pitch when they're Googling that was your the company. One. Yes. They start cracking jokes. I mean, like, how does this make you feel as a, a female founder? It's hard. I think it does make it very uncomfortable. I think you can lose your confidence very quickly going into these meetings. And I think, you know, uh, it's true. My husband has never been asked where our children are or how he plans on running his division with children at home. Um, it's, it's very disappointing that those questions continue to come up. So the pump itself is expensive. It originally retailed at you know, almost $1,000. You've brought the price down temporarily to six forty nine, dollars I believe, and now you're offering a, a lighter version for three ninety nine. dollars mm -hmm. um, You know, what makes you think it's worth it and, and mm -hmm. that maybe it's, it's the price that's keeping investors from getting behind it? Well, our, our price, the original price at $9.99 is actually less than half the cost of other hospital grade pumps. So our pump is hospital grade, which means it's a closed system and safe to use between women. So it opens up a whole mm -hmm. different opportunity in terms of rentals. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, you know, whether or not women will pay that much, um, they will. And they will because they're in it for a long haul. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our customers are planning on providing breast milk for about 12 to 18 months. So they really roll that in into their calculations of how much it's actually really costing them on a day to day basis. In terms of the lower cost model, we really wanted to open up another opportunity for moms to get in at a lower cost. If moms are not ready to invest in a, a breast pump, they can still explore Naya by pre-ordering our smart bottle, which is available on Kickstarter now, a set of two or 114 and one for 59. 
So you've just launched the Kickstarter we today. Did. You're raising money for the Smart Bottle. Right. What's been the response so far, and how does this fit into your bigger vision? We've had a great response so far um, with just women who believe in the mission and what we're doing in terms of making it much easier to provide the nutritional health or the nourishment that your baby needs. And so we're really encouraged. We're really optimistic about how it's going so far. And how that fits into the broader vision for Naya is that we really feel like we're building this insights platform where the hardware that parents are interfacing with really starts to answer some questions that they have, some anxieties that they have. We can start really taking the guesswork out of infant nutrition. And just quickly, because I think it, it's, it's really interesting, you've asked all your employees to work for minimum wage. They've agreed. Um, you know, how much more time do you have, essentially? We have a few more months. We have a few more months. Um, it's tight. I think every entrepreneur has to make these sacrifices, and we're lucky enough that we have a team that believes in the product. We have an amazing product, uh, and we're all very committed to making it work. All right. Janica Alvarez, CEO of Naya Health, thank you so much. Thank you. For stopping by. You can check it out on Kickstarter. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder, we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.